If you go online, there's no shortage of conspiracy theories. All right, so here's one. The virus was bioengineered in a lab by scientists to be used as a weapon or a form of population control. This is a theory former politician Bronwyn Bishop has also suggested. It is to get rid of non-productive um, Chinese in the Chinese community. In the words of George Bernard Shaw, should be eliminated um, so they don't have to be fed. Whoa. Roseanne Barr is calling the novel coronavirus pandemic a ploy to kill baby boomers. You know what it is, Norm? It has been a bizarre year, to say the least, and COVID-19 has made us question a lot. When will we get our normal lives back? How will we recover our global economy? And for some of us, where did this virus come from? According to a poll taken earlier this year, one in eight Australians believe that Bill Gates and 5G are responsible for COVID-19. While this might sound ludicrous to seven out of eight of us, conspiracy theories can have a genuine impact in the real world. According to Business Insider, 77 5G towers across the UK have been set on fire due to a conspiracy theory that links 5G technology to COVID-19. And additionally, 5G workers have been subject to abuse as a result of these beliefs. My name is Sam Breakgear and welcome to Brains Bike Back. This is your weekly podcast focusing on all things related to psychology, technology and our society. In this episode, we'll be looking at why these conspiracy theories receive such strong support from groups of people across the world. And to discuss this, we are joined by Dr. Jessica Mikono and Dr. David Morelos, hosts of Psychology After Dark, a podcast examining the dark side of psychology and the human experience, including criminal behavior, psychopaths and cults, to name a few. In this episode, we dissect the psychology behind why people believe in conspiracy theories, where we take a look at an article by Kendra Cherry titled, Why People Believe in Conspiracy Theories. And we use this to break down the three main psychological motivations for beliefs in conspiracy theories, a need for understanding and consistency, a need for control, and a need to belong or feel special. In addition to this, you'll also learn how confirmation bias impacts our belief systems, the legal implications of sovereign citizens' beliefs, and MK Ultra, the conspiracy theory turned real life story. And if you like this episode, then subscribe to us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts. Additionally, you can also subscribe to the Sociable YouTube channel where we publish all our podcast episodes. And let us know what you think by leaving us a review on iTunes or reaching out to us on Twitter at, at the Sociable. Now let's get into it. Sam, if Bill Gates was down to his last dollar, what would he spend it on? Good question, Sam. Well, if you haven't seen or heard it already, one of the most popular quotes in PR is from Bill Gates, who stated that if he was down to his last dollar, he would spend it on PR, and with good reason. Why? Because quality PR turns unknown businesses into established industry leaders. If you're looking to build industry credibility, reach new markets, or grow your business, our sponsor Publicize is a digital communication agency that has helped businesses like yours gain exposure in major online publications for the past decade. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brains Bite Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. Can you both uh, tell our listeners who you are and a little bit about your podcast, Psychology After Dark? Sure. So first off, you know, thanks for having us on your show, Sam. We uh, had a chance to listen to a number of the Brains Bite Back episodes. And so we're really honored that you asked us to be on. Yeah, Psychology After Dark is a pet project um, from Jessica and myself and that we thought would sort of be a cool way on pop culture phenomena that we both personally find interesting. So Jessica is a trained psychologist. She works in forensic psychology, which is the area of psychology that intersects with criminal and civil legal systems. She's a licensed and clinically trained psychologist who brings the professional and informed perspective to our podcast, if you notice that, and um, how psychological knowledge can help us understand the different events and phenomena that we talk about on the podcast. And as for myself, I'm sort of like a, a kook, academic kook, I call myself, who developed an interest in something known as transpersonal psychology, 
uh, which is a field of inquiry that looks at events and elements of the uh, human experience that are generally left out by mainstream psychology. So this includes things like uh, human consciousness and potential spiritual experiences, near-death experiences, uh, use of psychedelics, and that's just a few of the things that the transpersonal movement really looks at. It was born out of the 1960s human potential movement um, and was heavily influenced by theorists like um, William James, Jung, um, American transcendentalists like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who attempted to uh, use Eastern wisdom traditions as a way to inform contemporary psychology. Um, so thanks so much for having us, Sam. Um, so, you know, for, for Psychology After Dark, the, our podcast, we thought it would be interesting to bring two very different perspectives to bear on a number of dark topics that we both personally found interesting, but not necessarily focus on, for example, whether aliens do or don't exist. I mean, there are hundreds of shows and books and movies that deal with that question, right? So, you know, rather we focus on the psychology behind what these phenomenon can and do bring to the human experience. So some of the topics we've covered so far include things like alien abductions, serial killings, and conspiracy theories, which we're going to be talking more about today. Yeah, and I'm super excited to talk about it. I have to say, I love that episode and, and the, like I mentioned before, the cool, like your chemistry is fantastic. I'd highly recommend anyone listening to check it out and the one thing that i really admire about your show so like my podcast i love having people on and interviewing them and i get the most interesting insights from other people but one thing that i can tell from your podcast is that you you, you come to the table with everything and you come to the table with so much knowledge and research and it's so evident that this is something that you are both so passionate about so i i really admire that and i'm glad to have your knowledge on this show and i think that uh yeah you you make a, a really good podcast so it's great to have you here by all means the pleasure's all mine and as you mentioned we will be looking at conspiracy theories because i had to listen to that episode and i absolutely loved it i was so gripped and i really wanted to dissect what you discussed so if anyone's listening i definitely recommend they go out and perhaps listen to that episode before this one but by all means like i, I want to get into it and on your show, you reference an article from verywellmind.com titled Why People Believe in Conspiracy Theories by Kendra Cherry. Um, from what you discovered in that article and your own knowledge, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on why you believe people believe in conspiracy theories. David, maybe if you want to start and then Jessica, if you want to follow. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I really liked the the Very Well Mind article by Kendra Cherry. I thought it was very well researched as it related to the meta-analysis that was also referenced on our uh, podcast episode. And uh, I think that the reasoning uh, that Cherry cited in the article really resonated with me, that there are different needs that are satisfied by the belief in a conspiracy theory. Um, and that there are a lot of boxes that sort of need to be checked off when we're looking at conspiracy theories in terms of people devoting intellectual and emotional energy into them. So as Cherry referenced in the article, there tend to be three very distinct needs that can be satisfied by the belief in a conspiracy, that being a desire to understand how the world or events work. That's the epistemic need a desire to bring order and control to our lives, uh, or what we call the existential need. And lastly, the desire to feel that we belong and fit into some kind of group or social need. So that made a lot of sense to me. For, for me as a transpersonalist, I would also uh, sort of look at the bigger picture, including how all these reasons play into our need to create meaning in our lives. You can take a well-known conspiracy theorist um, like Alex Jones, who is a you know, a very well-known public figure here in the United States mm. and sort of speculate that he really believes that he is fighting a good fight, you know, perhaps defending freedom or democracy or the American way or, or whatever. But his actions are so passionate, I would argue, because they are a tremendous part of how he creates meaning for himself in this world. So I'm not saying that that's good or bad, but we seem to find that many people need to believe in something whether it be protecting the planet or something that's much darker, as we've seen a lot here in the United States, which is this issue of white supremacy, um, in order to create some kind of meaning for their existence on the planet. And this can include thoughts about what we are going to leave behind after we die. 
and our desire to stand out in the crowd, so to speak, in the midst of hundreds of millions of people who are all trying to do the same thing. So all these reasons, I think, play into a feeling of powerlessness that many of us feel while watching large scale events play out and knowing there is really nothing we can do about them. It somehow feels empowering to think that we know, and I put the term no in quotes, mm. um, even though what we think we know is not truly rooted in any kind of credible evidence. I think feelings of powerlessness can lead people to do a lot of very strange things. So I know for me, I often try to understand behavior through this lens. This is a lot like the Buddhist idea that violence is a manifestation of suffering. So how do we understand the suffering of people? I think that if we can do that, we can understand a lot of their irrational behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. I think you summed it up very well. And I think that that article hit a number of points, which I can definitely see like being characteristics of those that believe in conspiracy theories. Um, so yeah, essentially like confirmation bias is something that I've discussed on the show. And when it comes to all the kind of like biases and heuristics, the confirmation bias is the one that always sticks out for me. And it's the one that I always recognize the most in kind of like other people's behaviors and my own. But so I've definitely mentioned it a lot on this show, but I would love to know how you see it playing a role when it comes to conspiracy theories and why it's so important to explain the behavior of conspiracy theorists. Yeah, I mean, confirmation bias is one of a number of cognitive biases that impact the way that we think about things. I mean, if you look them up online, you'll find lists and lists of different um, biases or heuristics. Um, so this is just one. And cognitive biases in general are errors in our judgment or reasoning. And it's important to point out that we all have these biases. It's part of human nature and likely related to our brain tendency to try to simplify things. They can almost be thought of as shortcuts in our thinking, but because we're not taking in all of the available information, they can often lead to distortions in our thinking. So as I said, there are many, many types of cognitive biases, but confirmation bias appears to be really at play when we're talking about conspiracy theories. So what happens in confirmation bias is that when a person goes into a situation with a pre-established belief, they will highlight additional information that supports that belief while discounting or ignoring any contradictory information. So for example, if a person believes that coronavirus is a mild illness and that the government is inflating this illness to induce fear and compliance, they'll be likely to put more weight on articles or tweets or whatever that tells of people who are like asymptomatic or people who are only mildly ill or articles that say that masks and social distancing don't reduce the risk of infection. And those same people will be more likely to skip past stories about severe illness, long-term complications or the overload of the healthcare system. Or if they do read these stories and articles, they may dismiss them as fake, inflated, or even written by someone who's ignorant or quote unquote in on the conspiracy. So confirmation bias is problematic because it can lead us to ascribe less importance to information that could be critical in helping us have a full and informed understanding of an issue. And again, I, I just wanna emphasize that we all engage in confirmation bias from time to time. But in order to combat this, we need to be honest with ourselves that we all have the capacity to engage in this bias and look for signs in our own behavior and thinking that suggest we're dismissing contradictory evidence and also encourage ourselves to read information that goes against our own theories in a way that we're open to alternative explanations. So if we believe something, I think it's really helpful to think of, of our belief as a hypothesis rather than a fact. The way that, you know, in this way, we can take the mindset of a scientist who's gathering research to either support or reject a hypothesis. So in fact, when doing research, and I think David can probably speak a little bit to this, um, scientists are often encouraged to look for data that disproves their hypothesis. You know, putting that additional emphasis on looking for the facts and thinking critically about both the information that supports our beliefs and that which contradicts what we think can help protect us from, from confirmation bias. 
Yeah. And I also have to say that I think that it's it's particularly difficult these days to even be objective with our confirmation bias just because of echo chambers. And we all fall into them to some extent because, of course, if you have a Twitter account or Facebook or whatever kind of social media you're on, you're naturally going to follow stuff which interests you and stuff which you kind of want to see. And I feel that it's easy to fall into a sense of confirmation bias when you're selecting kind of like the the content that you you see in front of you. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I, I think that in order for us to get out of that echo chamber, we have to actively look and look for and read things that go against what our preconceived notions are. And that can be difficult to do. It, it's kind of like that extra step that we have to take. Yeah, definitely. I well, first of all, I have a family member that is a, a very different political opinions of myself but i love him and um we we're very close in every other aspect so definitely he challenges me in that sense and i try and challenge him there and going back to the point you first made about the reasons why people believe in conspiracy theories david when i was listening to that i have a, a couple of family members another one actually uh strongly believes in them but again he's a wonderful guy i love him and yeah. um, we have a great relationship and uh it was actually quite interesting because yeah when you were describing the the characteristics and their needs to fit in. I've always seen that. I've always thought of that as a, an aspect. It's almost kind of like a club, especially for like the flat earth theorists, those that believe in that, from what I see anyway. It's almost like they feel like they're part of an exclusive club or they're like, they know something that everyone else doesn't. But you did actually pick out a really interesting quote from the article stating people who are not as analytically inclined have a less tolerance for uncertainty this in turn leads to conspiracy theories as people grasp at explanations for things now i think you did a really good job of highlighting the fact that and i want to do the exact same that we're not saying in any way if you don't have a formal education then then you you are you did a fantastic job of wording it but <laughs> what we're trying to say is we're not trying to be elitist here right formal education aside do you see a way to remedy this lack of tolerance for uncertainty among groups of conspiracy theorists, potentially allowing them to become more analytical? Yeah, just just real quick, I wanted to jump back to that to the point you made about the social sort of ramifications about being in the like the in crowd. You know, I mean, even people who do formal research have to be on guard for this type of bias all the time. I was thinking about it in reference to pursuing a PhD and having to go through the whole research process, including addressing a number of different concepts, uh, things like reflexivity, um, which is the constant evaluation and acknowledgement of personal perspectives that you bring to bear uh, in your own research. There was something I had to deal with called triangulation um, and peer de debriefing which is a way for outside observer to offer unbiased feedback on your research methods. And these are all things that, you know, even the most uh, educated people have to constantly be on guard with because the, the desire and the tendency to want to be in a social sort of um, collective, you know, where people who have the same values that you do and you feel comfortable with them and stuff, it can be so powerful that you could be, engaging in bias without even knowing it. And so it, it's just sort of a, an interesting thing that even, you know, people who would do this professionally at the highest levels and create research uh, studies and stuff like that still have to be very conscious all the time of their own personal biases that they're bringing to the study. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to get back to you. I just wanted to answer your question about, you know, ways that we can kind of encourage people to become more analytical mm. and be less likely to engage in conspiratorial thinking. And, you know, there was actually a very interesting study that was conducted by Whitson, Kim, Wang, Menon, and Weber, which appeared in the Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin in 2019. And the study was entitled Regulatory Focus and Conspiratorial Perceptions, the Importance of Personal Control. And the researchers acknowledged that while there are certain characteristics, including things like educational attainment and certain kind of um, inborn personality traits that are associated with believing in conspiracy 
conspiracies, um, and those things are all difficult to change. There may other, there also may be other factors that are more malleable that can either reduce or increase the likelihood of, be, of one believing in conspiracy theories. And Whitson et al. believed that a sense of personal control was one of those factors, um, since we do know from other research that a feeling of lack of control has been shown to be an antecedent to conspiratorial thinking. So this hypothesis was based on regulatory focus theory, or RFT, which suggests that those who are more what they called promotion focused strive to do all that they can to achieve their goals, while those who were more what they called prevention focused spent their energy and their time just trying to protect what they already had. So the researchers believed that those who were more promotion focused would have a greater sense of control over their lives and therefore be less likely to believe in conspiracy theories. And their research actually consisted of three different experiments. Um, so during the first experiment, they had participants engage in writing activities that were designed to either increase a promotion focused mindset or increase a prevention focused one. Um, and then they had a control group where they just had them write about something new Neutral. And then they had the participants rank how much they believed in certain cons conspiracy theories. So in the second experiment, they had um, US military servicemen answer a questionnaire assessing their level of promotion versus prevention focus. And then they had them again rank how true they believed certain conspiracy theories were. And what was interesting, so in the first two studies, the results showed a significant negative correlation between those who were more promotion focused and the belief in conspiracy theories, meaning that the more promotion focused they were, the less likely they were to believe in these theories. So what was also interesting was that the prevention focused group and the control group were equally as likely to endorse a belief in conspiracies, um, suggesting that being more prevention focused didn't actually increase a person's likelihood of conspiratorial thinking. But correlation doesn't equal causation. And I think that's something that any student of statistics hears over and over and over again. And so with just the information from those first two experiments, the researchers couldn't confidently state that the decreased belief in conspiracy theories was because people were more promotion focused. So during the third experiment, um, the participants were engaged in a task, again, to either prime them to be in a promotion-focused or prevention-focused state. They were then randomly assigned to groups where they were asked to recall a time when they were either control, in control of a situation or where they lacked control over a situation. So after this, they were then again asked to rank their belief in different conspiracy theories. And what they found was that those who had been primed for promotional thinking, but then asked to recall times when they had little personal control over, over a situation, actually demonstrated an increase in conspiratorial thinking. So what this told the researchers was that people who would normally be less likely to believe in conspiracy theories can become more likely to if they feel that they lack control. And on the flip side, when people see their environment and situation as being controllable, it actually decreases the likelihood they will believe in conspiracy theories. And in fact, Woodson et al. made the suggestion that organizations like the Centers for Disease Control can actually increase public trust and you know, decrease people feeling like the government is conspiring against them with regard to public health issues just by providing people with information on what they can do to protect and promote their own health. You know, and, and so this makes me think about the conspiracy theories that are flourishing right now, you know, during the current pandemic. And I have to wonder if some of the reason these theories are so rampant is because people feel like they have really limited control over the virus and what's happening. You know, and I, I think part of that is because the guidelines have changed so frequently because we've had a very steep learning curve with regard to the, to the virus. Um, but, you know, I think that this study really illustrates that while increased education can help people become more analytical and reduce the likelihood of conspiratorial thinking, just increasing people's sense of control over their lives also works.
that's incredible that's also incredible to see as well that you can make that shift so obviously i was coming at this from the perspective of making someone more analytical they'll analyze something and then their intentional change but clearly if the control is like a a key factor that that's quite inspiring once again thank you to our sponsor publicize visit their website if you want to find out more about their pr for growth packages their free resources or even schedule a call and for a limited time only exclusive to brains bite back listeners you can receive an seo assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion to find out more visit publicize.co slash bbb I was also going to say as well, that reminds me of a point that you made, I think from the article, David, where you said that those that believe in conspiracy theories are less likely to vote. And the actual family member that I'm thinking of that strongly believes in conspiracy theories, he doesn't vote because he believes that it won't make a difference. Like it's all controlled by, I don't know, outside forces or whatever. So I definitely see the parallels there. Following the article, I think, David, you mentioned that many conspiracy theorists have a negative view of human nature in your experience. And I I completely agree with you. I've seen the same thing. Do you think it's possible to change a person's level of optimism of human nature? And do you also think that this could impact the likelihood of them believing in conspiracy theories? So, you know, interestingly, dealing with misinformation and this sort of pseudo conspiratorial thinking is a lot of what we do in the prison system. So correcting faulty thinking of criminals is quite literally a full time job for both Jessica and I. Uh, Many times I will encounter prisoners who believe that tuberculosis tests are a covert way of giving all the inmates AIDS or that the government actually makes huge amounts of money by keeping people incarcerated. So beliefs like these are usually part of a system of core beliefs that position people to believe that control over their lives lies outside of them rather than inside. Something that I have to wrestle with a great deal in my work with prisoners has a lot to do with learned helplessness, which is something that I personally think will become more important in the prison reform as time goes on. This concept was developed by Martin Seligman and Stephen Mayer uh, back in the 1960s and essentially suggests that people with external locus of controls will tend to blame their life circumstances on things outside of them rather than own responsibility for managing their life through sound decision making. So obviously this doesn't mean that bad things don't happen to people because they certainly do, but conspiracy thinking and rumor seems to flourish among inmate populations because a large part of criminal thinking is often invested in this sort of learned helplessness. That is the conviction that nothing will ever change regardless of whether they make good decisions or not, even though this belief is patently false. It is the, this belief that keeps them stuck in these pathological patterns and for many that keeps them returning to prison. The purpose of treatment inside the federal prison system is to start to rewire this kind of thinking by challenging the belief that prisoners' lives are dictated by uncontrollable outside events and influences. So as the prisoners start to combat their learned helplessness, they learn and develop an internal locus of control or something Seligman and Meyer called learned optimism which is the idea that they can affect positive change in their lives, however small, by making rational and informed decisions. So when the inmates start to do this, like clockwork, they stop being invested in these conspiratorial beliefs or believing that powers that are out there are against them, and they start focusing on how to create a better life for themselves in the here and now. So in effect, they become less affected by things they can't control and they start to focus on what they can control, giving them the opportunity to take back their power, so to speak. That is, that's impressive. And it's especially because like, you've experienced this. You, I mean, obviously you were talking about a study there, but like in your own experience from, from the work that you do, you, you've seen this and witnessed this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's a big part of what I do professionally. I work in substance abuse treatment with federal inmates inside of a federal prison. And breaking down these ideas is the single biggest and most important part of that, I would say. Yeah. So what's interesting, you know, we're talking about optimism and and David was kind of talking about working with with people inside of 
prison with inmates. And, you know, what we know about optimism is that, you know, about 25% of how optimistic or pessimistic a person in is, is heritable. But that means that 75% it are, is affected by things that we have some control over. So, you know, one of the ways that we can train ourselves to be more optimistic and one of the things that we do with the inmates is that we, we help them learn how to monitor their thinking and how to counter particularly negative and pessimistic thoughts with more positive and optimistic ones. And, you know, the trick here is that the thoughts have to still be realistic. They can't be so Pollyanna-ish that, you know, they don't believe them. And so this is really the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and so that's a very popular type of therapy. You know, most people will refer to it as CBT. And while going to a, a therapist can really help us learn ways to change our thinking, there's also a ton of, you know, self-help books out there that people can, can check out to, to see how to do some of these techniques on their own. You know, other things that have been shown to increase optimism are things like engaging in mindfulness activities. I know that there's a really big movement for um, engaging in different mindfulness practices. Um, and also things like writing in a gratitude journal. So we, we also wanna be aware of who we surround ourselves with. You know, I think everyone's heard the saying, misery loves company. Right. And I, I think that that's really true. You know, generally people will respond in kind to the emotional states of those around them. And if we surround ourselves with people who are generally pessimistic, who, um, you know, are always kind of looking for this conspiracy going on, it can also affect our own sense of optimism. And I think it's important not just to spend time with op optimistic people, but also to remember that our own attitudes affect those around us as well. So, you know, by being more optimistic ourselves, it encourages others to be that way as well. And, you know, like we've been talking about, a sense of personal control really appears to decrease a person's tendency to believe in conspiracy theories. And I would argue that optimism and self-efficacy are, are really related. And research has shown that those who score higher on tests of optimism are also more emotionally resilient. And one aspect of resilience is an internal locus of control, just as David was discussing, you know, meaning that we feel that we are basically the drivers of our own lives. And self-efficacy is that belief that we can succeed, or in other words, we have control over ourselves and our situations. And so it really makes sense that as optimism increases, so will that sense of self-efficacy, and as a result, the tendency to believe in conspiracy theories will decrease. So I wanted to also just throw it, uh, a reference back to one of the your podcast episodes. Um, mm -hmm about the one about teaching children problem solving skills through video games. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great episode, by the way. And I started thinking about that. Uh, yeah. In, in reference to what we're discussing and you had asked the question earlier about helping people become more analytical in nature. And I think that is a great way or can be a very effective way is to sort of teach kids at, starting at an early age, how to be, think more analytically by allowing them to emotionally regulate themselves when dealing with very difficult problems, sort of taking a step back, sort of um, remaining calm, learning how to think through problems, how to solve problems, but also, as Jessica was talking about, also helping them to be more optimistic in the sense that they know that they'll be able to make it through this. They're going to come out the other side okay all because they have been through this type of thing before. They've faced problems before, they've faced adversity before, and they've gotten through it. And so this would give them a, a tremendous sense of self-empowerment, I believe, and help them regulate those negative emotions that can often lead to powerlessness. Yeah, it definitely seems that um, optimism and a sense of control is a reoccurring theme here with these kind of beliefs. And talking of um, regaining control or taking control, uh, Jessica, you did raise an interesting point regarding what is a conspiracy theory and what is a delusion, because you mentioned like 50% of Americans believe in at least one conspiracy. 
theory. So it's kind of hard to like lump them all into one group, like you mentioned. And I mean, hey, I'm I wouldn't describe myself in any way as a conspiracy theorist, but there are certainly some which I hear and I'm like, mm, that's plausible. Um, <laughs> but I did uh, really enjoy your example of sovereign citizens in courts and how it's kind of like a gray area. Uh, would you be able to share with our listeners what is a sovereign citizen and your experience dealing with them in courts? Sure. So sovereign citizens are very interesting to me. And, you know, while we use that label to refer to a group of people that hold similar beliefs, um, this isn't the name of a particular group. And there's several different groups from all different racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds that sus subscribe to this ideology. So sovereign citizen more describes an ideology than a, sp a specific group of individuals. Okay. So um, additionally, these groups, they may have some differences with regard to the specifics of their beliefs, but the overarching theme is that they believe the U.S. government is operating outside of its jurisdiction. So one theory is that uh, the U.S. government became bankrupt and that it's using U.S. citizens as collateral in trade agreements with foreign governments. Um, many of them also believe that there are secret bank accounts for each of us at the Department of the Treasury and that you can access these funds by using certain financial documents. Just want to tell you that's not true. I've never seen it be successful. Um, and sovereign citizens will, um, you know, they typically pick and choose which parts of the government or legal system that they think are legitimate. So, for instance, many will argue that they're not required to pay taxes or get driver's licenses or register their cars. And while many argue that the government and by extension, the court system has no jurisdiction over them with regard to enforcing these laws, they will then turn around and use the courts when it suits them. So um, one of the tactic, tactics that they often use is filing fraudulent liens against people for doing things like using their names without permission. So many of them believe that their names are copyrighted and that they're owed money anytime anyone speaks or writes their name without their permission. Um, so, you know, they'll use the court system to file these liens or to file grievances against people. So I think that while the majority of the population would immediately see problems with these lines of thinking, we can also see some reasons why it might be attractive. Um, I don't know very many people who love paying their taxes. <laughs> I don't, maybe that's just me. Um, I don't know anyone who likes standing in line at the DMV. You know, but people do these things because, number one, it's illegal not to, and the consequences for not doing them tend to be pretty severe. And number two, because most people see the value in taxes or certain rules or regulations. You know, but some people think that the battle's worth it for the chance that they won't have to do these things or because they really believe that these things are unjust. Now, you can imagine if you were in court and you're telling the judge that he or she doesn't have jurisdiction over you or you're refusing to even participate in the legal process, that can be very problematic, um, especially in the context of criminal legal proceedings. So sovereign citizens tend to be pretty steadfast in these beliefs. And as with many conspiracy theories, the subscribers will dismiss a lot of contradictory information. So in the United States, we have a lot of rights during criminal proceedings, including the right to consult with an attorney, the right to present evidence of our innocence, and to confront our accusers. So if someone isn't participating in this process, it can raise concerns about their mental health. And U.S. laws prohibit the trial of an incompetent defendant. So there was a landmark Supreme Court case in 1960 called Dusky v. U.S., which set forth the requirements for a defendant to be considered competent to stand trial. And if you're interested in mental health law, it's a great case to look up. But the gist is that for defendants to be competent, they have to have a factual and rational understanding of the nature and consequences of the proceedings against them. And they have to have the ability to consult with their attorney. Um, and I think we would, all are, we would all agree that it would be pretty unfair to try someone with a mental disorder that impairs these abilities. So in the federal system where I work, there only has to be a bona fide doubt about a defendant's mental health in order to trigger a referral for a competency to stand trial evaluation, which is by far the most common type of evaluation ordered by the courts. And a bona fide doubt, that's a pretty low threshold. So 
you know, it makes sense that when lawyers or judges encounter individuals who subscribe to sovereign citizen beliefs, um, you know, which to most of us sound pretty illogical, they would want the person assessed further to see if it's related to a mental health disorder or if it's rather what we call an extreme overvalued belief that's held by a number of individuals. Now, to be clear, there are some people who subscribe to sovereign citizen ideology who also have a mental illness, but the majority don't. And the belief in this conspiracy theory in and of itself is not a mental illness. You know, in fact, the Anti-Defamation League estimates that there are more than tens of thousands of people who subscribe to these beliefs. So, you know, it's, it's more common than maybe it would seem at first blush. And if you've never encountered an individual that has these beliefs before, um, they can sound pretty out there. Um, but that really is the distinction between a delusion and an over extreme overvalued belief is the number of people who also believe the same thing. Um, and that's really what makes sovereign citizens, it's not a delusional belief, it's just another conspiracy theory. Yeah, I think that was a fantastic way of summarizing how a lot of it can be down to like perception or it's, like, it's, a, it's a fine line between someone believing in conspiracy theory and someone being delusional or, or yeah, it's, it, it's complicated, it's complex. Actually, you mentioning that, I'm not sure if this is true, but I think it's Wesley Snipes, the guy that played, is famous for playing Blade in those right. those movies he was part of a religion where they believe something like that like you're not a citizen of a country and i know that he went to jail for tax evasion and that was the reason i think because he was part of like something which sounds like a sovereign citizen um group so so yeah i can definitely see how it's probably more prevalent than we might expect in society yeah yeah that's a great example he's probably one of the most famous um, examples of a, an individual that subscribes to this type of ideology. Yeah. So finally, this is my last question, and it's going to be a hard one to summarize because I know you dedicated <laughs> a whole episode to it, and you briefly mentioned this conspiracy theory turned like real life story, uh, MK Ultra, on your conspiracy theories episode. So yeah, I know you have a whole episode dedicated to this that our listeners can go check out. Uh, definitely should do that. But can you briefly explain? what this is and what happened there for anyone that doesn't know about it. Yeah. So this is one of those conspiracies that actually turned out to be true. <laughs> Back in the 1950s, there was uh, an inf officially sanctioned program through the Central Intelligence Agency here in the United States where they started experimenting on citizens, basically. They wanted to figure out a way to try to brainwash and control people, uh, essentially, hopefully turning, uh, capturing spies in order to use them during the Cold War and turn them. You got a whole episode to, uh, dedicated to this. So if anyone is listening and want to learn more, that's definitely the place to go. I think also it's kind of nice to conclude the episode with, I don't know, it's interesting to finish the episode with one which actually turned out to be true. Right. So, yeah. On the topic of checking out that episode, if people do want to follow Psychology After Dark or keep up with the work that you're doing, either on like your social media or any websites you want to point them to, how can people do that? Um, so yeah, we're available on all of your normal podcast applications. Um, you can also find us online on our website at psychologyafterdark.com. And you can find us on social media on Facebook and Instagram at Psychology After Dark. Awesome. Fantastic. David, Jessica, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having us, Sam. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you, Sam. That is our show. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something from it. If you like conspiracy theories and there's something you're genuinely interested in, they are a reoccurring topic here at The Sociable. So you can go to sociable.co to find them and you can also find all our previous episodes of Brains Bite Back up there. Additionally, you can also subscribe and follow us on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. We hope you join us again, but for now, have a wonderful day.